In 2006, we established a SCAR keloid specialized unit in the Department of Plastic, Reconstructive, and Aesthetic Surgery at Nippon Medical School in Tokyo, Japan. Since then, we treated approximately 2,000 new SCAR keloid patients annually. This extensive experience has greatly improved the efficacy of the treatments we offer. In this video, we would like to introduce our latest research and clinical practice. Keloids and hypertrophic scars are caused by cutaneous injury and irritation, including trauma, insect bite, burn, surgery, vaccination, skin piercing, acne, folliculitis, chickenpox, and herpes zoster infection. Superficial injuries that do not reach the reticular dermis never cause keloidal and hypertrophic scarring. Keloids and hypertrophic scars have generally been considered difficult to treat. Keloids tend to be a bigger problem than hypertrophic scars because they also relentlessly spread sideways. These pathological scars can be very itchy, painful, and disfiguring. Moreover, if they are located near a joint, they can contract, thereby restricting joint mobility. However, our extensive clinical experience and research on pathological scars have led to highly effective treatment methods that mean that we can cure even congenital keloids and contractile hypertrophic scars, the most aggressive of the pathological scars. Here we will describe some of our key studies. First, we'll discuss the studies that elucidated the various factors and mechanisms that initiate and promote the relentless growth of these quite mysterious scars. And second, we'll describe our studies searching for the most effective clinical techniques. All keloids and hypertrophic scars display chronic inflammation in the reticular layer of the dermis. The skin consists of three layers, namely the epidermis, papillary dermis, and reticular dermis. Keloids and hypertrophic scars only develop when the dermal reticulum, the deepest layer, is damaged or inflamed. This explains why surgery, which generally involves a full thickness incision in the skin, is a common cause of pathological scars. For the same reason, ear piercing can cause the ball-like keloids that grow on the ears. Subcutaneous injections that aim to induce local skin inflammation can also generate pathological scars. For example, the BCG vaccination in childhood can cause dumbbell-shaped keloids that run down the upper arm. Other causes of dermal inflammation can also generate keloids, including folliculitis, which is highly inflamed acne. This can lead to keloids of the chest, jaw, neck, and shoulders in young people. Keloids and hypertrophic scars can also arise from shallow abrasions if the wounds become infected and the inflammation spreads to the reticular dermis. Our analysis of data from 1,500 patients visiting our SCAR keloid clinic showed that in the Japanese population, 49% of large idiopathic keloids occur on the anterior chest. These are keloids not caused by surgery or piercing. The main cause of keloids on this region was folliculitis. Thus, children and young people should be monitored carefully if they have anterior chest folliculitis. We also found that keloids are extremely rare on regions with bone immediately under the skin, namely the scalp and shin. They also never occur on the upper eyelids. These observations suggest that wounds on the anterior chest should be followed closely, whereas injuries or surgery on non-susceptible areas require less attention. The distinct keloid localization pattern described above may reflect the fact that the keloid-prone body regions undergo regular skin stretching due to body movements, whereas the non-susceptible scalp and shin do not. For the upper eyelid, its skin sags naturally, and thus opening and closing the eye does not induce stretching tension. These findings suggest that local stretching mechanical force 
can promote pathological scar growth. This notion is supported by two other findings. First, joints are highly prone to contractile hypertrophic scars. While these scars generally subside spontaneously after a few years, they often will not do so if they're near a joint. Instead, these scars will continue growing to form contractile scars that impede joint movement. Second, keloids tend to adopt region-specific shapes that directly match the predominant directions of skin tension. For example, keloids on the anterior chest which is constantly undergoing powerful left-right stretching due to arm movements, often develop a crab's claw shape. Another example is shown by our computer simulation analysis, which modeled the mechanical force on a left-right running dumbbell-shaped shoulder keloid. These observations explain, for example, why training in the gym can cause keloids on the chest or abdomen to get worse, and why minor wounds near a joint can result in severe scar contractures. This knowledge has helped us to identify the body areas that are particularly at risk of pathological scarring and therefore require close attention during and after surgery. It is well known that women are more likely to be treated for keloids than men, and our analysis of data from 1,659 patients who visited our scar keloid clinic showed that keloid patients are two to three times more likely to be female than male. The prevailing view in the field is that this reflects social factors rather than a genuine predisposition of females to keloids. In other words, people assume that women are more likely to seek treatment for unappealing scars. However, when we analyze the data of people who developed keloids in childhood, we observed that girls were three times more likely than boys to develop keloids, and this did not reflect greater medical attention. The possibility that female hormones could promote keloid formation is currently being researched. Our studies indicate that local mechanical tension can provoke or worsen scar inflammation and excessive collagen deposition. How mechanical tension promotes pathological scarring is not yet clear but we speculate that abnormal blood vessel function may be a key mediator. An important role of blood vessels is to act as a dynamic barrier between tissues and the circulation. Thus, the endothelial cells that line the blood vessels usually adhere tightly to each other, thereby preventing cells and large molecules in the circulation from entering the tissues. However, if a tissue has been wounded, it sends signals to the nearby blood vessels, which causes their endothelial cells to pull away from each other, thus allowing cleaning and reparative inflammatory cells and molecules to enter. This process is called vascular permeabilization. Endothelial cells are known to be exquisitely sensitive to mechanical forces. We speculate that if these cells are subjected to strong, repetitive, and unending pulling, the vascular permeability after wounding does not return to normal. Consequently, inflammatory cells and factors continue to flow in and activate fibroblasts, which cannot stop depositing collagen. Several of our studies support this scenario. Our analysis of the data of patients treated at our scar keloid clinic showed that patients with severe keloids were much more likely to have hypertension than patients with milder keloids. We believe that high blood pressure may worsen keloids because it adds to the mechanical tension on the endothelial cells. When keloids are cut into slices and examined under the microscope, a procedure known as histology, their reticular dermis is observed to contain so-called keloidal collagen, which is characterized by abnormally thick, twisting, translucent ropes of fused collagen fibers. Keloidal collagen is responsible for the bulkiness of keloids. The prevailing view in the field is that these collagen structures are the end result of inflammation, which has caused the collagen to degrade. However, keloidal collagen is not seen in other diseases. Our recent histology studies showed four things. One, 
Keloidal collagen is directly produced by fibroblasts. Two, these fibroblasts all lie adjacent to the blood vessels. Three, the blood vessels are abnormal, often occluded, narrowed, or disrupted, and appear to spill cells and cell fragments into the reticular dermis. And four, keloidal collagen starts being produced very soon after keloid onset. These studies support the notion that impaired blood vessels allow ongoing local inflammation, which causes nearby fibroblasts to directly produce keloidal collagen, which in turn induces keloids to expand beyond the original wound boundaries. We have observed that some patients are highly susceptible to keloid formation. They develop them in childhood, and the keloids are often severe and very difficult to treat. By contrast, other patients who develop keloids only do so in adulthood after surgery, serious injuries, and or the advent of vascular diseases such as hypertension. Moreover, these keloids are often relatively unaggressive and easy to treat. This suggests that some patients have an inherent constitution that promotes keloid formation. This constitution may relate to vascular function and or inflammation, and the factors that shape it may be largely genetic. These cases can be classified as primary, that is congenital or idiopathic keloid cases. The second type of keloid patients may be those where vascular dysfunction or inflammation arises only after other conditions develop. As such, these cases can be classified as secondary, that is acquired keloid cases. This classification system may be helpful when determining the treatment strategy for individual patients. Thus, primary keloids require early diagnosis, early aggressive treatment, close follow-up, and careful attention to small injuries. In contrast, a more relaxed approach can be taken with secondary keloid cases. We are currently establishing this classification system for clinical use. When we established our SCAR keloid clinic in 2005, the treatment options for pathological scars in Japan and elsewhere were limited, and dismal outcomes were frequent. Surgery often led to worse scarring, corticosteroid injections were painful and made little headway with large scars, and other treatment options had mild or unreliable effects. Patients had no choice but to live with their keloids. Steroids have long been known to dampen the inflammation and fibroblast activity in keloids. One way to deliver steroids is to continuously cover keloids with steroid-containing tape or plaster. This approach has become a mainstay in our therapeutic algorithms for pathological scars, partly because in Japan we have access to two types of steroid tapes and plasters. The first, a fludroxicortide tape called Drenosol, is accessible elsewhere in the world, but it's a relatively weak steroid preparation. The second is available only in Japan by prescription from a Japanese physician. It is a depredome propionate plaster called Eclair, which is a strong steroid preparation. Our usual initial approach with small or moderately sized keloids in adults is to apply the strong steroid plaster. The plaster is cut so that it does not contact normal skin and it is changed every day. Mini keloids and hypertrophic scars will flatten after six months to several years of this treatment, depending on how long the scars have grown. Once the scar has softened and flattened to the point that the patient cannot feel it with eyes closed, the frequency of plaster application is reduced. The scar may still be red at this point, but it will gradually fade and the scar will eventually acquire a more normal skin tone and become less noticeable. The plaster should not be continued when only redness remains because it will thin the skin and cause additional reddening. Children can be treated with the weaker tape. The tape, and especially the plaster, also play a key role in ensuring that pathological scars do not recur after surgical resection. These tapes and plasters should be affixed as soon as the slightest hardening or growth is observed in or around the surgical scar. Another way to apply steroids is by injection with Kenacort. However, one problem with this approach is that the injection can be quite painful. 
we have established a method that is both much less painful and more effective. In the past, the drug was injected directly into the hard core. However, not only does this increase the pressure in the scar, which causes pain, the drug is contained within part of the hard core, which makes it less effective. Our approach is to mix the drug with a local anesthetic and then, using the finest needle possible, inject the mixture little by little into the bottom and edges of the scar from the soft surrounding area. It is often sufficient to inject once every one to three months, and the flattening effect can be augmented by using steroid tape. In fact, if the steroid tape is used correctly, often only a few injections will be needed. Large keloids can generally only be debulked by surgery. However, surgery by itself associates with atrociously high recurrence rates, 45 to 100%. This can be prevented by applying another vital component in our pathological scar armamentarium, namely post-operative radiotherapy. From our clinical experience, we have established finely tuned post-operative radiotherapy regimens for specific body sites that use as little radiation as needed. For example, after keloid resection, anterior chest wounds receive 18 grays over three days, and earlobe wounds receive eight grays over one day. Routine application of these regimens has seen our keloid recurrence rates drop to 10%. Moreover, since all the patients are carefully followed up after surgery and are treated with steroid plaster when the slightest sign of recurrence is observed, patients no longer have to fear that their keloid will ever become problematic again. Since mechanical stretching tension promotes keloid growth, we also use surgical techniques that disrupt this tension. One of these techniques is the Z-plasty, where a linear wound that runs in the main direction of stretching tension is sutured in a zigzag pattern. This effectively disrupts the stretching tension. It is particularly useful for wounds on the anterior chest and shoulder where tension is strong. We also routinely apply a type of stitching technique called subcutaneous fascial tensile reduction suturing. This involves placing sutures in the tough connective tissue under the skin. This strongly pulls the wound edges together and means that all of the sutures used to close the overlying skin layers, including the dermis, where pathological scars start growing, encounter very little stretching tension. More information about our scar keloid clinic and laboratory can be found on the website. Please take a look if you have time. Thank you very much.